for coming, everyone. Uh, I'd like to start out by giving you a quick outline of what I'm going to be talking about so you can make an educated decision about whether you should be mailing at this point or not. I know I always appreciate that. Uh, basically, my talk is split into three parts. And in the first part, I'm going to go through sort of the bestiary of window management aggregation to try to convince you that perhaps you have a problem with your parents on the In the second part, I'm going to go through a brief tour of XMOM to convince you that maybe XMOM might be a solution to those problems. And in the third part, I'm going to have a brief discussion of what it takes to, to customize XMOM uh, show you how you can change things around, and also provide you a link to my own configuration so you can start what you want. So at that point, I'll be able to convince you to start me on GitHub, essentially. <laughs> so what is in it for you in this talk? Uh, well, what you get out of this talk depends on what you um, first of all, if you are not a Linux or BSD user, you may not be able to use Xmonad directly because those are the platforms where it's best supported. Uh, if you're on Mac, it is possible to run some flavor of Xmonad there, but my understanding is it's a little spotty. I haven't actually tried it myself. There's another project called Amethyst, which attempts to port a lot of functionality over using more native uh, Macintosh systems. So you might give that a What's that? Solaris. I think it might work on Solaris, but I don't know for sure. I haven't kind of tried it myself. But in general, it seems to work on more of the, the Unix-based systems. Um, if you're running X, you're probably OK. Uh, so is anyone here already using X on it? I tried it. You tried it out? Yeah. yeah. So if you already tried it, um, then this may either expose you to some new ideas for how to tweak your configuration, or it may introduce you to like a pre-made configuration that could kind of get you a few steps further than the very, very basic default setup. Um, and if you're unfamiliar with Xmonad, then this will help you kind of learn why you might be interested in Are there any Haskell programmers in there? Except for hacking the configuration file. Well, yeah, that's exactly where I'm at. I was going to say, if there was one, he would be the only one. Because <laughs> I'm not asking. There was one, and he left. He left already. <laughs> okay, I know that's already. All right, so I'm going to give you a little context about myself to start this out. Uh, I am a very patient person. Uh, some people might call me a stoic. At work, if I learn a client has ordered a complete redesign of a feature that I just finished working on, I just shrug and move on to the next phase. At home, if my daughter comes to me and she is cradling an eight inch banana slug in both hands with slime dripping off of her fingers and informs me that his name is Sluggy. And that she loves him and she wants to keep him. I just calmly try to explain that Sluggy yearns to be free and in the wild. <laughs> However, there's one area where I'm not a patient man. It's one kind of seemingly trivial task which can fill me with aggravation, and that area is window management. Not only do I hate managing my own windows, I hate watching other people manage their windows. It drives me crazy. I feel like my needs in window management are relatively modest. There's just a few things I want. One is, I want virtual desktops. I want to be able to organize all the programs I'm running without any of the big clutter. I want to be able to launch any program instantaneously after realizing that I need it. Don't want to have to blunder around and use to do it. I know what things are going to launch are called. When I decide that I want to change a virtual desktop or select a program, I would ideally like it to happen slightly before I make the decision that I want it to happen. So that by the time I realize that I need it to happen, the program is already in front of my face. That's right. My ideal window manager features recognition. I also never want to have to fiddle around with aligning my mouse pointer with the little corner of the window so that I can drag it and become the size I want to ever again. Windows should always be the size I want them to be without me having to do anything. So I guess I'm looking for a of these ones. Come to think of it, I pretty much never want to touch mouse at all. And once I have all this working, I want to be able to stay up to date on my operating system of choice without having to worry that the rug is going to be yanked out from under me by some kind of total redesign of my window manager. Is this so much to ask? I ask that question. <laughs> Well, let's first take a look at how we're doing on these kind of requirements in some other typical existing environments. It is a mixed bag, to say the least. So let's look at some examples. Okay, so launching software. This is a situation that has actually improved a lot in the past few years. Uh, there are a variety. There are a variety of keyboard-based launcher applications you can be using. 
a lot of desktops such as uh, a bunch of Unity or Gnome 3 are now building them in. So I think that we're actually doing pretty good now. Virtual desktops. So this is this is a problematic area. Um, a lot of, of uh, Linux-based and other uh, open source desktop environments do support virtual desktops, but there's some problems with how they choose to do it. Um, number one, a lot of them insist on animated transitions between desktops or some kind of wayfaring widget that pops up in a different way. And these are useful to communicate to the average user what's going on. But if someone spends all my days switching desktops around, I don't really want to deal with that. So for instance, in GNOME 3, I haven't actually looked at GNOME 3 for a little while, so this may have changed since the last time I looked at it, but you go to swap workstation, uh, workspaces, and the spin thing pops up in front of you, showing you which way you're going. I just push the button, I know I'm going that way. Uh, likewise for Unity and Ubuntu, which is the platform I'm using, um, this little widget pops up right in front of what you're doing, it shows you the preview of the thing you're already kind of seeing because you already navigated that window but it kind of blocks you from seeing what you're doing. Um, and then there's another issue which I didn't have a screenshot of here, but most window managers, when you choose to switch to a different uh, virtual desktop, it is swapping both of your screens at the same time. So you have to set up you know, what you want in a layout of two screens if you have multiple screen desktops. And when you switch, it just assumes you're going to want to switch both of those at the same time. Why should we assume that? Wouldn't it be nicer if we could change them independently from each other? Okay, so task switching. This is where things are getting really ugly for me. I tend to open a lot of windows throughout the day. I don't know about you guys, but this is something that happens to me a lot. Uh, it's important to me to be able to find the one I'm looking for as quickly as possible. And the sad truth is that my attention span is about that of the average internet user. So if I get distracted by something off in the corner, I may forget what I'm doing and suddenly I'm off looking at Twitter or whatever. Um, so when I'm working on one task, I prefer not to be burdened with knowledge of all the other things that might be going on on my, on my screen. So we're going to take a quick look at how Windows 7 handles this. I know it's not an open source or Linux related thing, but it's so bad there that I just can't resist poking it. Okay, so the first big problem here is that they have the great idea that all of your window borders should be transparent. Oh, so you can see the program behind it in kind of a fuzzy way. Just what I wanted, a distracting glimpse of all these things that I'm not currently working on. Now, this is a mode which is technically called Arrow Peak. Uh, I have always referred to it as uh, WCF mode. <laughs> uh, I don't use Windows a lot, but somehow when I do, I accidentally trigger this all the time, and I, I couldn't even tell you what the purpose of this is. It's just, what's happening? Uh, so when you want to start cycling through programs to choose the next one, you end up with this endless loop of skewed, stacked on top of each other window views, and you just have to keep tabbing through it until you find what you're looking for at an angle. Uh, or you can also choose you know, a traditional path closure, um, which has this, this great extra feature now, where as you tab through this, all the windows except for the one you're currently selecting are transparent, and then the one that you would select is not transparent. So they just kind of jump around the screen in this bizarre dance. Um, How does that look with the other windows? <laughs> I don't know, but I don't really, I don't really want that. <laughs> Um, so the situation on Linux is somewhat better, but there's, it's still overburdened with cool-looking but time-consuming animations. So we're on Node 3. Um, it, this is not so bad, except the problem I have with this is that it's actually a hierarchical task switcher. So as you are switching through your tasks, if you get something where you have more than one window open, you can't just keep tabbing through it. You have to realize, oh, there's more than one of these, and then you can kind of go down a level which I never can do smoothly. I was in big multiple passes before I did it. <laughs> uh, Unity is also hierarchical. We can't see it in the screenshot, but, uh, well, this, there's two Chrome windows over here, there's little, little arrows there telling you that there's, there's going to be more of them. When you get to the one you want, it pops up with more choices down there. Uh, animation, there's skewing, there's all kinds of stuff going on here that I don't need. Uh, the last problem, Actually, not the last problem. The next problem we're going to look at is window sizing. This is what actually drove me originally to try XMonad. 
So let me set the scenario for you about my typical day. I've got one window with code in it, I've got another window with a terminal in it, and maybe a third window with a browser in it. I would like to have two or more of these on the screen at the same time, and I would like to have them consuming all the space on the screen. So what I would find myself doing is, oh, I need more space for the code, so I'll drag this thing over here, and then I'll drag this thing over here. Oh, wait, no, now I'm looking at the terminal. Oh, now I'm looking at a log file that's really wide, so I'll move the code up on top of the terminal, and i just be dragging stuff around all the time. Um, so, it, this makes me a little upset just talking about something. Uh, stability. Uh, this is an, another reason that I switched off of kind of more mainstream desktops. Uh, mainstream desktops are changing frequently, and there's there's good reasons for this. They're trying to improve their user experience. They want the new version of their OS that's coming out to have some kind of noticeable feature that makes somebody want to upgrade to the new version. And there's also, of course, just fashions that, that go through, like fashion for flat design, and when someone thinks, oh, we need to redesign all our stuff to be flat design. The, the problem that I have with this is that the use case that they are optimizing for is not my use case, and I suspect it's not your use case either. Um, for me, window management is a tool that I use to get my job done. I don't need a lot of handholding to tell me what's going on. Um, once I've swapped workspaces or changed windows for the 10,000th time or so, I'll probably get a handle on it. Um, and the muscle memory that I've built up to know how to get where I'm going quickly is expensive. When they change things, it's very jarring for me. I have to unlearn things before I can learn new things. I like to learn things, but I prefer to choose the things that I learn, not be forced to learn because someone decided to totally redesign the window. So uh, the core problem here is that we as developers and other power users are just not the target audience for the software. Um, there's far fewer of us than there are average or beginner users. So it's the right decision for UI designers to target more average or beginner users to get them onto the system. Um, and it's especially the right decision because UI designers know that they can rely on us as power users to figure things out and make it work for us, even if it's not working for us right away. Um, so, but what I'm suggesting is that, as power users, we can look outside the mainstream and try to customize our environment to make it fit to our needs better than what is, is just off the shelf. So, I'm suggesting that XMonet is a great way to accomplish this, and we're going to start taking a look at that. So, what is XMonet? Uh, XMonad is one of several window managers out there which classify themselves as tiling window managers. This means that rather than you manually positioning things on the screen, they will try to position them for you. Um, there's something like a couple of dozen of these available for X. And I have to admit, I haven't really looked at any of the other ones because the first one I tried on someone's recommendation was XMonad, and it's worked so well for me that I haven't really looked at it. Um, XMonad is mouseless, if you want. I mean, you can actually use a mouse with it just fine. But you can do everything in terms of window management tasks without ever touching the mouse. Uh, it is implemented in Haskell. Now, for some people, this might be a big game. For me, it's sort of a, I don't really care what it's implemented in, but it is often mentioned because it is one of few sort of UI-centric programs that is implemented in Haskell. It's sort of an unusual use case for the language. Um, it is very highly configurable. In fact, uh, the configuration file you write is not really a configuration file, it is a Haskell program. Xmonad is more like a library which you use to write your own window manager if you, if you really look at it, how it's set up under the hood. Um, that can make it a little daunting to get into, but I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, you can also use it in a few different ways. You can, I choose to use it standalone. But a lot of people also use it inside other environments like GNOME or KDE just to manage their windows. And then they still get all the other things that come with those desktop environments. Um, but what I will be showing today is a more minimal approach of running XMonad directly on top of X and then sort of cobbling together various other little pieces of software to give you a few other conveniences that you can't live without. So there's some things that XMonad is not that you should also know about. One is that it's not easy to learn. Um, it's not designed to be self-documenting. Uh, it is meant to be efficient to use after you've learned it, which is a different and often conflicting goal to being easy to learn as you use it. It's also not trivial to configure, as I mentioned. There's no control panels. There's no straightforward configuration files. 
and you want to configure it, you're going to be looking at Haskell code, or you're going to be wiring together small other programs for passwords. It's also not very visually impressive, depending on your personal aesthetic. So, to use an art metaphor, uh, if, if other window managers are kind of more like a Botticelli painting with, you know, your programs are flying in from off the screen and so on, uh, Dexmine is more like a laundering painting with just lots of <laughs> straight lines and angles. Okay, so let's start taking a little tour of Dexmine now. Um, I'm going to quickly show you what a default install of Dexmine looks like, and then I'm going to switch over to doing a demo of my own configuration. Uh, so as an aside, where can we use this? So we'll be looking at Xmonad on Ubuntu. It can be used on most Linux or PSD distributions, possibly Solaris, I'm not sure about that. Uh, and if you're a Mac user, you might look at Amethyst, which is some of the attempts to port the core functionality of Xmonad uh, into WebDC. Okay, so what you get with the default install, if you go onto your system, you use your package manager, and you, you know, app get install, X one in. And then you start up and you choose that window manager. This is what you see. <laughs> you may not be able to see the line. You know, it's just a black screen with a mouse pointer on it. There's no menus, there's no trace, there's no bars, there's no icons. Nothing to indicate to you what you should do. Uh, it shares some things in common with Vim in this regard. <laughs> you might have trouble figuring out how to do an exit at this point. Um, you, there's a key combination you hit to launch a terminal. There's another key combination you hit to bring up a prompt for launching software. Uh, the default prompt that we use for launching software is called the D-Menu. That's what we're looking at up here. It's just a little bar, it's kind of hard to see on the screen, but someone's typing in FIR and they're given some choices to match it. Firefox is one of them. You get entered and launch Firefox. That works okay. Uh, so if you were to launch a terminal, it would look like this. I'll get to the giant red bar in a second. And uh, once you launch a few other programs, it might look something like this. So, at this point, it's going to be a little hard to understand what's going on without actually seeing it happen. So I'm going to switch over to a demo. Uh, and I want to say a few things before I do that. One is that almost everything I'm doing here is going to be driven by keyboard bindings. I'm not going to waste your time by saying what the keyboard bindings are because they're completely configurable. Everyone changes them, so there's not really much point. Um, and then the other thing you might notice as I start this demo is that I've made some changes to the setup that you saw before, which was nothing. Uh, I've added a little status bar. Uh, I'm using a different launcher, which is called Synapse, which is great. And I even have wallpaper, although you only see it when you first launch it before you run any programs. Uh, okay, so here we go. So we're going to start by looking at tiling. This is where I have to see if I can operate the screen in reverse here. Um, okay, so let's go to. So, okay, so. So let me launch a few programs to see how that works. So we're going to launch Chromium, Edit, Terminal. Okay, so we've got some programs running here. Um, so first of all, notice that there are no title bars in any of these windows. It strips off all the kind of unnecessary Chrome um, because you don't, you don't need it in this layout. Uh, another thing to notice is that there's a giant red border around this program. Normally when you're using Xmode, this would be one pixel thick. I made it wider for the presentation so you could actually see it. Um, but this tells you that this is the actively selected window at this moment. Um, so you can change which window is focused just using your keyboard. See, so I'm kind of walking through it. Um, some programs that do things with transparency, the border doesn't show quite right. So I actually have Chromium suggested it. Uh, it's selected down there, but I guess to have rounded corners, it has some kind of transparency thing going on. Um, there is this concept called master pane. So you'll notice that right now, one program is really big, and the other ones are all kind of small and sharing space. That's because this program, the most recently launched program, is currently occupying the master pane. Uh, I can go to another window, and using a key combination, just jump it over to the master pane so I can easily kind of swap what I'm focusing on. And you can change the number of windows that are over in the master pane. If I just put two in there, it'll split the space. You can do that. Um, you can resize the master pane with respect to everything else. And of course, you can close windows by just putting up the window. Okay. 
So that is the basic tiling functionality of XML. So the next thing I'm going to talk about is layouts. So the strategy that XMNet uses to decide where things are placed on the screen is called the layout. Not enough for advancing my notes while looking at this. Uh, <laughs> here. Um, so you can configure any number of layouts that you want, and then you can advance through them just by hitting the space key, essentially. From up there. So right now, we're looking at my bar here. It says, we're in resizable hall. That's, that's this one. Uh, I've also set up a few other ones. I've got mirrored resizable hall, which is just sideways. That one's great if you're looking at a log file or something where you really need it online. Here's the setting in Chrome for using the new manager decoration. Oh, yeah, that would, that would make that not, that would probably be a good idea. Yeah. This is also a kind of packed version of the configuration that I set up specifically for this talk so that you put everything on the screen that's not my main screen. So that would be the best thing to do. Um, another layout is. The full screen layout. I use this one a lot. You can also just have it hide the taskbar and then you're really full screen. So if you're looking at a terminal that way, it's a terminal. You've got the whole thing. Um, another layout is this grid. No, this is this is the three column layout. A um, few of these layouts I don't actually use anymore. I have kind of stripped things back. This is the one that I hardly ever use, so I, I've taken it out of my regular but just for the sake of showing some variety, they're kind of weird here. It can be kind of handy if you're writing some code and you need a lot of small terminals open up or something like that. But in general, the, that first one, the one big one on the side, is kind of um, This one's kind of silly. This one's called Circle. It plays all the windows out in a circle with one big one in the middle. I don't really use that one either, but it's kind of neat to see it. You might want to use this if you actually want to see your wallpaper. That's, that's pretty much the only case I can think of for for doing that. Um, so, so the great thing about layouts is that you know, XML is not actually reading your mind, but once you internalize how these things work, it feels like it's reading your mind. Because you're expecting things to happen the way they happen when you push keys. It's very predictable where windows are going to end up. Um, so really, rather than training the window manager, it has trained you to expect to do what it does. And it, it, it works out great once you've done for a little while. So, the next concept here is workspaces. Uh, this is what XMNAD calls virtual desktops, essentially. Um, so, a workspace is a name that's associated with a layout and a collection of windows that are on that workspace. By default, in the default configuration, there's just nine of them. They're attached to numbers, and you can jump to them by number. Um, you can also assign them names. There's lots of different ways to use workspaces. Some people set them up so that you can create them on the fly, which allows you to basically tag the programs you're working on conceptually and then jump in them that way. I'm more of a spatial thinker when it comes to this kind of thing, so uh, I have a layout I use where it's like a standard set of them, and they're associated with the keys on my number pad, so that when I'm on a full-size keyboard, I can just use the number pad and it kind of jumps me spatially to the section that I'm thinking of. I name these after what I typically put on them, and I try to get in the habit of putting software that's related to that topic onto that workspace, and then things just are more or less where I expect them to be, which is great. Um, so, just a quick thing like that. So we're on a workspace right now called Dev. It's a little confusing because you're seeing the multiple windows thing happening here. It's this one in orange right now. Um, this list is showing all the workspaces that exist that have anything on them. There's, there's more than that that exists, but different ones are um, So I can go to a different workspace. I can a couple more programs. Squash, squat, and pull between them. Um, and then, of course, you can send windows between workspaces. So I just took this terminal. I can use move back to the zone or send wherever I want to. Um, it's important to know that you can have a different layout on each workspace. So you can get things just the way you want them on one part of the project you're working on, and then leave that and not see it at all until you come back to it and it'll be exactly the way you want it. So is that send to a workspace, is there a 
a combo that you're using where you specify which one, or is it like the next one? Well, you have, you have two choices. One is you, well, essentially, if you hold down shift with the combination that would take you to a workspace, then it will take the window with you that you currently have. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, so that is workspaces. Uh, we also have advanced workspaces. So the great thing about workspaces is that they're programmable. You can, in your configuration, set up rules for them. So you can do things like you can say, if I launch this program, I always want to go to that workspace at the station. Workspace, automatically. Or you can say, this particular workspace always has a certain layout and it never changes. So some examples of, of ways I use that. Uh, I have a workspace called chat, where I keep all of my chat sessions and I should launch engineer. Twice when I get the bar show up. So it knows the name of the roster window and it always keeps it in this position on the left at that size. And I guess it's not a long filter to So if I open chat windows, they just tile to the remaining space. So I never have to mess around with like, who's in front of who? What's going on? Um, another kind of workspace I use is I have one called Pix, which I use for image manipulation. Uh, I use the GIMP for that. And uh, in previous versions of GIMP, it was kind of a sore spot in XMONET because it has all these palettes and stuff floating around. And, and palettes are kind of an area where it's a little rough with XMONET because it doesn't necessarily know that it's a palette, depending on how it's been identified by the program. So sometimes it'll try to tile them. Uh, I, I got around with that by using that, that layout I was showing earlier where there's like a big vertical thing and things on the side. But newer versions of GIMP have this great feature where you can tell it single window mode, and then all the, all the palettes and stuff are inside the window. So that kind of solves that whole situation. Okay. Um, multiple screens. This is actually my favorite part. No, it's not my favorite part, but it's a really good part. Uh, so, as we talked about earlier, on most other windowing systems, the virtual desktop spans all the screens, and you have to change them all at once. But on XMonad, screens are independent. You can send any workspace to any screen. Uh, this is really hard to demo, so instead I'm just going to use this screenshot or this little illustration from XMonad's own documentation. So the idea is that you have this idea of target screens, and there's a key combination you can use to choose which screen you're interacting with. So if I said I'm using screen one, and then I switched which workspace I was on, it would affect screen one. But then I can switch back to screen two, and change workspaces, and it would change from there. So as a result, you can kind of mix and match exactly what workspaces you want, and not be forced to try to think about that in advance and get them all exactly the way you want. Uh, okay, so how's the exponent doing on my original criteria? Yeah, we got virtual desktops, and um, we can erase them any way we want, with any combination of on one time. It's great. Instant launching. Okay, so that doesn't actually do the launching for you. It really doesn't do anything for you except for manage your windows. So, but the great thing is, this means that you can pick what you want to launch your windows. You can find the program that works best for you rather than it being sort of coupled to what you're using for your window management. Um, it's not really instant, but it's as instant as it can get because it's just dependent on how fast the software takes to launch. All right, so. My title is kind of a lie. There's no actual telepathy or recognition going on here. But this does make it possible to organize your windows in such a way that you can get to them as pretty much as quickly as possible. I have a hard time imagining a system that would be much faster. Um, and again, no telepathy here. But uh, it does encourage you to damage your brain in a way where it feels like there's telepathy happening. So I think that's okay. That works, that works for me. Uh, yeah, it's pass free. <laughs> Stability. So, I've been using Xmonad since I think 2011, which was shortly after Ubuntu switched to Unity. Um, and since then, I have been upgrading to each all the apps that comes out. And I have, my interface has essentially not changed for those three years at all. So, I, I count that as a success. I have had to do some kind of minor tweaks each time to deal with like slightly different package versions, but it's been it's all been packaging changes, not uh, 
not the UI changes. Okay, so let's look at customizing it. Okay, what's involved in that? Uh, well, the main thing that's involved in that is hassle. Uh, <laughs> so the configuration file for Xmonet is called xmonet.hs, and it's just a giant blob of hassle. Uh, you don't really have to learn hassle to use Xmonet. I certainly didn't learn hassle. Uh, I cobbled together things that I found online, learned enough of the syntax to be able to you know, getting to compile successfully after three or four tries. Uh, so the process of configuring it uh, involves a lot of looking at what libraries are available online, reading their documentation, importing them into your config file, and then kind of messing with their settings. Um, it did take me a while to do it. It was, it was kind of enjoyable. It sort of was twisted that way. The, the hacking workflow for Xmonad is you make a small change to the config file, you hit mod Q, the great thing about this is that it recompiles your window manager and then reloads it right in place. So all of your software is still running. Um, so it's a pretty good turnaround for, for testing things out. Uh, if you a compilation error, you'll get a big message about it and you can kind of revert and sort over. Uh, just a little hint, you will cause a compilation error almost every time. <laughs> At least I did. And then you repeat until it works the way you want it to. Um, one of the, the kind of not directly related to XMonad, but still great parts of XMonad, is that it encourages you to understand the rest of the system better, because it doesn't do that much for you. And when you find that you have to add in some little piece of them, you end up, you end up looking around for some little piece of software that solves the problem for you and doesn't do anything else, which, which I find a much more refreshing way of kind of dealing with, with an operating system. Um, there's a lot of great little standalone tools for X that you can piece together into a larger system, which does exactly what you want and nothing else. So the learning curve is pretty steep, but I found the payoff to be pretty high. So here's an example. That status bar that I had to have on the screen. This is showing, if, if this screen was at full resolution, this would all be online. line. So I chop it up so you can actually see the whole thing. Um, so this is built using a piece of software called XMOBAR, which is just a very minimal status bar program. And uh, there's actually kind of three main things that are going on here. So this stuff, the various system stuff and so on, is actually collected by XMOBAR. It has this configuration file where you can format this line, and then you can tell it just a command line program to run to get whatever values you want and piece it together. So if you can concoct a command line to get a value that you want, you can put it in your status bar very easily. Very easily to buy. <laughs> Very easily, once you've learned the configuration. <laughs> um, another part is this chunk that was over on the left that's kind of showing you what workspace you have selected. And also, this is the title that would normally have been in the title bar of the software you're running. It's now at the top. Um, this is done by something called Dynamic Logbook, which is actually part of your XMonad configuration. And it just pipes this text back to XMobar to display. And then finally, there's a little corner of it which is not actually done by the bar at all. So if you're not running this program called Stallone Tray, it's a great name, uh, your bar would just kind of end. Like you, you define how far it should go, and I tell it to end a certain number of pixels from inside the screen. And then I run Stallone Tray, and that basically lets you run programs that put things in a, in a taskbar, in a tray. Uh, the main reason I have that is for Wi-Fi connectivity. So you can use the same connection of question tools to uh, to build a wide variety of different types of layouts. I've seen ones with a bottom or the side or whatever you prefer. Uh, it does take some tweaking to get there though. So this is a kind of list of, of software that I like to use with uh, that. Saw my launcher Synapse, which is a uh, it's a great tool. Unfortunately, it, it seems to be maybe going through a period of not so much maintenance right now. I'm not sure exactly what's going on with it, but uh, the version of it that is packaged in Ubuntu at this point doesn't work. So I had to use a PPA. Um, uh, Nitrogen is a program where all it does is it sets your background. That's it. Uh, XComp Manager provides composition support, which is 
X1 and without that does no transparency. If you run anything that uses transparency, you just get boxes. But you just run a full program and that fixes that problem for you. Uh, I still just use Nautilus, the default uh, uh, file manager from uh, going to for my file management in general. But uh, I also experiment with Pinar, which is one from XFCE. That was a little more lightweight. Uh, I use Terminator in the terminal uh, and an applet to get network management. Uh, and XRender is a great command line tool for messing with your screen settings, which is something that's a little more challenging when you're using something like this than the number of lines. Um, so I put my configuration up on GitHub if you want to try it out. Uh, I had it working on Precise a few years ago. I've since gotten working on Trusty as well. Very commented. I won't vouch for the quality of the Haskell. Um, in fact, that's quite the opposite. It's probably terrible. I just botched it together from stuff I found online. Um, but you're welcome to take a look at it, fork it, try it out. It is, it is pretty easy to set up. Uh, and that brings us to the end. So, any questions? Yeah. Uh, like hardware uh, detection manager over uh, the USB device, uh, when you get those kinds of systems. Right, right. All right. Is there an issue for that? So, uh, the question was about hard detection when you plug something in USB or something like that. Um, most of the use cases I have for that are with getting files into the system and so on. And that actually gets handled by the file manager program. So I plug something like that in, I, I launch Nautilus or Thunar, and it will still show up in the sidebar just like it would if I was using it or something like that. Um, in terms of other hardware, it, it may be a little trickier. You find yourself sometimes using command line tools. Uh, <laughs> One thing that I had to figure out how to do was um, I, I really hate trackpads because I'm constantly rushing them. Very well. uh, so I had to learn how to disable my trackpad uh, at, at launch time without having any kind of console for doing that. So that was, that was an interesting learning process. Uh, you have to kind of you have to use one program to output all the things connected to USB and kind of search for which, which what the idea of it is before you can turn it off. Um, but again, so these, these things take a little time to figure out, but usually once you figure them out, they stay fixed, and then when the next version comes out, you just kind of bring the whole config over, and you're not having to like re-mess with all the settings. Did that answer your question, please? Any other questions? Can you start directly from X and do you start X? Oh, no, so um, you can, but uh, the way I set it up in the configuration of the address is I actually have it showing up as a choice in the window manager. Oh, so and I even made a little icon for it, so it shows up with the right icon and everything. <laughs> um, it makes it a lot easier to launch. You know? yeah. Yeah. Yes? Related to that, since I pretty much ditched things like GNOME and stuff like that, I use Slim as my window manager, or as my, yeah, my desktop manager. Right. Um, and that just essentially calls your uh, X session or your X in an RC file, which will then launch X1 add. So it gives you like the login box and the, the username choice, but you don't really have the choice to switch between sessions unless you change it in your X session file. So that really that replaces GDM? GDM and uh, light DM. So it's a lot lighter. Okay, that sounds like, like yeah, that sounds like a good solution for using. I I occasionally still find myself launching into no, 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 no. Yeah, then GDM uh, will work better because yeah. it's more configurable. But this is the great thing about the whole this whole approach is that it's so configurable that as you find things that work better for you, you can try plugging them in. If they're not all treated as one big blob that you have to take together. Yeah. Yes. On uh, the multiple screens, workstations, or workplace workspace spaces thing, I can't um, remember the name. If you're switching <laughs> from uh, focus on one to the opposite. Your editor here and turn on the next. Model. Yeah. Uh, is that one key combination that you can get from there? Okay, so you, the question is you've got two, let me start getting one You've got like two windows set up and you want to switch focus between them, between a change terminal across screen. Yeah, so when you switch which screen you have focused, it will, I believe, focus the last window that you were using, the, the last program that you were using. Well, actually, I've seen, I guess, it's like if I use. Now I use Alt Tab just to go through all of the windows that are on yeah. all of the screens. Um, is that going to be? Am I going to be able to set that up the same way with X Monad doing two different screens? You can just 
or the mod key and W takes you to the left screen, E takes you to the right screen. The third, you have a third screen to the third screen just by port. There's yes. sort of like a window list. There's no, there's no like overall list of every window that you're running on any workspace. So there, there are times where if you're not putting things in places where you know where they are, you can get lost. They wander off. Yeah. Um, however, there are there are uh, extensions that you can use that allow you to do things like search through all your window titles to find something. Like you can actually do an autocomplete yeah. start by being the title of the web page that you read. Yeah, yeah. And I, I don't have anything like that set up, but there are things out there that solve these kind of problems. Any other questions? All right. Oh, yes. Well, I, I wanted to say I, I tried it, and, and I found out what was happening was that, uh, just like with any web manager, normally I'm only using one program at a time, and I would just go into the mode is it all space? Is it's full screen. Yeah. Go, go in the mode where it's full screen, it's one app and it's a small tab, and I can do that on my window. This is a very good point. So if, if you are, if your use case is that you're almost always just running one program, maybe even just two, yeah. this may not be worth it for you. So if, for instance, you're developing in the terminal all day and you're using something like Tmux inside there, and, and you're not having to do a lot of window switching, then this may not save you a lot of time. Normally, yeah, normally I've got a browser window open and a terminal window. And that's about it for our studio. Right. And right. RStudio will be full screen. And it would be a browser, our studio, or a terminal. Or a terminal. That would be it. Yeah, then in, in that case, this may not be the right match for you. It really makes more sense if you have kind of a lot of different things going on in different places. I, mean, they all I work in web development, so yeah. so I very frequently have a code editor, multiple browsers, yeah. I've got my email over here, I've got chat over here. I mean, I have things all over the place. Yeah. So if you find yourself with you know managing 10 or more windows, then it's sort of becoming pretty handy. If you have just one window, and you're, and you're managing tasks a different way, then it may not make sense for you. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, one, one of the uses I get out of my current manager that acts as a um, little bit of a workaround is like show me all of the uh, browser windows that I have open. Right. And sometimes I'm doing that just to close them. Like there's actually <laughs> a little X there. Yeah. yeah. I use yeah. KDE uh, as a window manager. And so it's got like a little X there to close the windows as you're looking at the thumbnails. You can just like kill them off just by uh, clicking yeah. from the expose. I'm wondering if there's something kind of like that. Like you just say, take all of the Chromium windows and tile them on one screen together. So the question has to do with ways to kind of quickly flip through all of your programs and, and kill things. Like shrink them all. Like, is there a scaling? Sort of um, I'm not so sure about scaling. It's not something that I've, I've really investigated. I do know that it's, it's very possible to flip through things really quickly because of how they bring it up. You can close things with just a, a cord. Um, so, like at the end of the day, my model on this basically is <laughs> I kind of quickly go to all the workspaces and wherever I find Windows, I'm just close, 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 close. It's, uh, you can do it really quickly. Um, it won't really help you visually find Windows in that way. You end up actually kind of looking at the real thing, not looking at a, a small representation of it. Um, that hasn't proven to be a problem for me, but uh, I can see that sometimes in some cases it can be. Is, is there any, like, um, you mentioned the, uh, the transparency from XCOM, is there any other, like, compositing that's plugged into XCOM? XCOM itself doesn't do any compositing, so that, that little program, all it does is support compositing for other programs that are running. So, for instance, my launcher kind of is in Synapse. Without XCOM Manager, all of this does is a white box. Yeah. Um, but, I, I believe there are some extensions that explain those things with transparency, but it's not something that I've like, messed with so much. Any other questions? They have a, their site is really quite good in terms of, of uh, just like a giant list of every extension that you kind of dig around. It's pretty interesting to see the various ways that you come up with to, to solve different problems. Some of which I never would have thought of in a million years. Sort of really creative ideas. There's a whole list of uh, 
of uh, people's configuration files that you can use to start yes. attack from them. Yeah, yes, that's how you hide clouds, don't lie down, just find your website work. Yeah, go through a bunch of other ones. I think my time's up. Yeah. So uh, thank you all for coming. Appreciate it.